Our Father, which art in heaven, you have indeed poured out more light, more blessings than we can contain because you promised that you would do that very thing. All the light that is shining upon us right now, it's, it is very much overwhelming. And dear Father in heaven, your servant Moses, when the Lord proclaimed his name, when he showed him his glory, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and by, no, and by no means clearing the guilty. When that glory was revealed to him, he hastened to bow himself before you. And dear Father, as we behold thy glory, it is our desire that we humble ourselves before you and bow before you. May that glory overwhelm us as we behold this glorious manifestation of thy power in the reform, reform lines. We pray for the continued outpouring of thy Holy Spirit. We pray for his guidance and we claim the promise contained in the book, The Great Controversy, that your holy angels would prepare our hearts so to comprehend thy word that we shall be charmed with its beauty, admonished by its warnings, or animated and strengthened by its promises. We pray that you would accomplish that here this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. Exodus 34, verse 6, verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord. Where does that take place at? That's what's being illustrated here, brothers and sisters. And as far as the, <clears throat> the way it's portrayed, I was not concerned about whether it's accurate, whether the ark is setting this way in the sanctuary in front of the curtains or this way. That was not important to me. What was important for me is to put the ark this way so that Brother Noel could get the artwork in it. It's not about the position of the ark. Now, if there's an argument to be made about that Christ would be working, if this was Christ in the most holy place facing this way, that isn't an argument either because the Bible places this vision of God's glory that Moses received at the midnight cry. And if we're going to get technical, I mean, I can't imagine a high priest wanting to move into the most holy place and walking backwards into the most holy place while he's getting in there. He's got to be this way, right? And so the point is, is that we're, I'm trying to tie together the symbols that are in there. And to me, it appears that Moses was watching the work of Christ in the most holy place. And he was seeing him work. He wasn't seeing his face. So if you turn to your notes on page 8. I did not hear Brother Tyler or Michael deal with Daniel chapter 8. <clears throat> I don't know what kind of depth they went into on it. But typically in Daniel chapter 8, we spend some time on the Chow Zone and Mare vision. And... Uh, if they dealt with that, that'll be beneficial. But for years, that's what we dealt with, was those two visions in the book of Daniel. But recently, at the prodding of a sister, we ended up looking more closely, sanctified prodding, at the Mara vision. And uh, Daniel chapter 10, I trust 
Tyler went through that. Yes? Okay. I'm going to put it in the record very quickly one more time to move beyond it. In verse 7 of Daniel 10, um, we're going to see Daniel receiving the Mara vision, and we're going to see the separation that is marked at the beginning of the binding off period as those that were with Daniel when he receives this vision flee. That would be Judas and the foolish priest of our history. It would be Judas and the foolish Levites of their history. And so in verse 7, well, let's start <clears throat> in verse 5. I trust that Tyler put in place that from 9-11 until the vision is given to Daniel that there were 21 days. Okay, so let's just move into the vision and go forward. Then I lifted up mine eyes, this is verse 5, and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body was as like, was like the barrel, and his face the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the Mara vision, M-A-R-A-H, feminine for Mare, which is E-H. For the men that were with me saw not the Mara vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. <clears throat> now, technically, with the prophetic message, Daniel's been hidden until here, and he sees the Mara vision, and the Judases they go to hide at that point. So you can see Daniel coming out of hiding when they're going into hiding. Verse 8, Therefore I was, a left, I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. This is the prophets that see the appearance of Christ, which is the mare. And verse 9, Yet I heard I the voice of his word, and when I heard the voice of his words, then I was in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And we read last time on page 6, second quote on page 6, that here Daniel falls as one dead. I'm saying that there is a death, a spiritual death that takes place in this history that Daniel is illustrating, that all the prophets are illustrating. Verse 10, And behold, a hand touched me. And Daniel is going to be touched three times. And when we first began to recognize this, we were so accustomed to when we seen three that it had to be the everlasting gospel. It had to be the three angels' messages. But then we begin to realize that there, the number three can also represent the binding off. And by context, you have to determine whether it's the everlasting gospel that is developing and then demonstrating two classes of wor worshipers, or if it is the raising up and empowerment of the messenger that is going to present, or messengers that are going to present the message through the next period of time. Okay, and uh, Brother Mark was showing me <coughs> right after lunch the evidence that in Daniel 12, many are purified, made white, and tried. This is both. This is the binding off, and it's the everlasting gospel. Amen. So we're, we're finding that even some of the illustrations of the three steps can be understood in both by context uh, places. For us at the end of the world, Daniel 12 is marking the binding off. For the beginning of Adventism, Daniel 12's Many Shall Be Purified, Made White and Tried, is the everlasting gospel of the Millerite history. But in any case, in here we're going to see three touches. Uh, verse 10, And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hand. He said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For unto thee I am now sent, and when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine 
heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God. Thy words were heard, and I am come forth for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now, we know historically that this is marking the empowerment of the first decree in the time of Cyrus when the angel comes down and connects with Cyrus, gets him going the right direction. Uh, but what I'm saying is that this is where an angel comes down here and the angel that comes down is no less a personage than Jesus Christ because this is the Mare Mara cause and effect. When, when Daniel sees the mare, when he sees the appearance of Christ in this history, I'm not saying Gabriel isn't there also, Brother Duane, but when he sees Christ, that is the cause and the effect upon Daniel is he is slain. He's dead. All right. Um, now verse 14. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for, it is, for yet the vision is for many days. The angel is coming to explain to Daniel what's going to happen in the latter days. And, and you know when he gets to the conclusion of this vision, he's going to say, be strong, be strong. So this is right here. okay? And he's being empowered to give the midnight cry message in the time of the Levites. And he's told, I'm come to make you understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. What befalls thy people in the latter days? This history. On to the close of probation. The message he's given to Daniel to understand is this history onward. All right, because the time of Daniel, there's hundreds and hundreds of years still in advance of him but Daniel's more perfectly being empowered right here. He's being given a message of both the external and the internal. The internal here is what shall befall thy people in the latter days. But by the time he gets to the end of this experience, he's going to be told that I'm going to go back and labor with the leadership of the United States. And when I've... Shortly thereafter, the United Nations is going to come. Tyler put that in place, right? Okay, so um, let's read on. Verse 15. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground and became dumb. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. What touches this is number two. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remaineth no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again, and the third time touched me, one like the appearance of a man. More often than not, when you see the word appearance in God's word, what is it in the Hebrew? Okay, but the vision that Daniel has in verse 7 and onward is the Mara. These are the same words. This is the masculine. This is the feminine. This is the definition for this is appearance. We just read it. Okay, this is the looking glass. But, if you read on, um, verse 19, And said, O man greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. So where is this taking place? Right in there. Be strong, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, now brothers and sisters, <clears throat> there's a doubling here. There's a doubling marked here. Okay? 9-11, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down, and in verse 2 he cries mighty, mightily, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. 
at the Sunday law, Revelation 18, 4 through 6, double under her, double. Okay, so there's, there's doublings at these waymarks, but the doubling at this point we see nine out of ten times or more is marking the midnight cry, but still you have to do, define it by context, and the context we use to define this as the midnight cry is once he's empowered, he's going to be told that Gabriel's going to go forth and struggle with the United States, the Medes and the Persians, and as soon as that struggle's over, Greece is going to come, the king of Grecia, and the king of Grecia is the king of the nations, it's the king of the United Nations, it's the United Nations, it's the He's going to struggle for this period of time with the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy and then the seventh kingdom of Bible prophecy is going to come at the Sunday law. Um, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee, and now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia? And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee, show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. I would even suggest here that when it says, I will show thee what is written, noted in the scripture of truth, it is marking the point in time where the disciples are on the road to Emmaus and the Lord removes his hand from their eyes and they have understanding of his word, just as took place for Sister White in this same parallel history in the 1846 to 50 time period when prior to that her mind had been blocked. And then after they had established the pillar truce, the Lord removed her, his hand from her mind and she had an understanding of that what was noted in the scriptures of truth. In your notes under the Mara, you can see the definition for Mara and for Chao Zone. I will not spend time on that, but I will take you now to the first mention of Mara and yes. No. Zechariah is back here rejecting the prophetic message. He's going to speak here. Daniel's here. He's not a symbol of someone that is rejecting the prophetic message. He's a symbol of someone in here that isn't speaking because he's dead. This is a spiritual death. And these three touches are an empowerment that takes place that concludes with be strong, be strong, because now he's here. He's at the midnight cry. What's he going to do? He's going to proclaim the message of the midnight cry. He has been perfected to be one of the messengers of the midnight cry. So in Genesis 40, I was about to say, I, do, I don't think any of us have went through the symbol of Dan to Beersheba. It's nice if we have that in place, but it is a matter of public record. Maybe most of us in here already know that. But when you see Dan to Beersheba together in the scriptures, it's always, always identifying the history of the midnight cry to the Sunday law because it is a symbol of the period of, the, of time where the two sticks begin to be joined together. Okay? Right here in the line, the stick of Judah, this is Jehoiachin. The Sunday law is Zedekiah. This is the conclusion of the stick of Judah, but right here where Jehoiachin is, is the seventh to the last king of Israel, which is going to have six kings that gets them to the end of Hosea. This king, the seventh king in Israel, is Jeroboam II. And he goes to Zechariah, where many things are remembered at the Sunday Law prophetically. Jeroboam too, just profound that his name means contention, because this is where the contentions start. His name means flock, but because he's Jeroboam too, this is the second flock. Right here is where the second flock begins to be awakened, as Joel says. 
to the issues that are going on in the United States. Because here is where the image of the beast, the combination of church and state is coming together in the United States, and every step of apostasy that is taken by the United States is going to bring a, an escalating judgment of God in its wake. Every one of them. This isn't, this isn't my opinion about this history. It's detailed, mar de marked in a very detailed fashion in the scriptures. These are the birth pangs of the, the east wind that begins here. And they just, birth pangs, sisters in the audience that have had children, they get stronger and stronger and closer and closer together, right? Okay, so right here, this decree. And you need a couple witnesses for a decree, and you've watched that there's a decree at this way mark, marked in the book of Esther. And I think you might remember that in 2 Chronicles 29 and 30, this was addressed, that Hezekiah sends out a decree right here that was to go from Dan to Beersheba, which is this history. So we have more than those witnesses of a decree here. The United States is going to pass some kind of decree here. They passed a decree here, which was the Patriot Act. Sister White says every principle of the Constitution will be repudiated. Repudiated means denied. The Patriot Act was a repudiation of the Constitution, the fundamental principle of the Constitution. The Constitution is based upon English law, and the essence of English law is that you're innocent till proven guilty. And English law came into history in retaliation, so to speak, or whatever, to Roman law, which had been in history for hundreds of years, and Romans' laws, the essence of that law is that you are guilty until proven innocent. And that fundamental principle of the Constitution of the United States is that we're innocent until proven guilty, but we all know, as well, most of us in here are citizens of the United States, that right here it changed. They can come in right now due to the Patriot Act, even if the Patriot Act has ran out, They've already got the president in place if they wanted to come into this room right now and arrest us all and put, it, put us in a prison and not tell anyone where we were and not give us any legal representation, they can do it. That's Roman law. We're guilty until proven innocent. So the Constitution, well, there was a decree here that was a direct strike against the Constitution, and the Constitution is the sanctuary of strength for the United States. And the United States has been typified by pagan Rome. And in the book of Daniel, there is a special prophetic strength for pagan Rome, which happened to be the city of Rome. Okay, and the city of Rome was going to be polluted. And pagan Rome's sanctuary of strength, which was the city of Rome, Rome being polluted in that history, is typifying the sanctuary of strength in the United States that is polluted. And the strength of the United States is the Constitution. And the pollution of the Constitution is beginning right here, even, even before there were legal precedents that were setting this situation up. But there's something coming right here that marks the midnight cry. And <clears throat> when you look at the midnight cry to the Sunday law in terms of the statements where Sister White says, in the time of the end, every divine institution is to be restored. And she identifies the two divine institutions that were instituted in Eden as marriage on the sixth day, Sabbath on the seventh day, and then in another place, when speaking of these two divine institutions, she says they are twins, twin institutions. It means that the characteristics of Sabbath and Sunday crisis are paralleling the characteristics of the marriage crisis, whatever that may be. And therefore, we can look at the components of the Sunday law crisis and expect that those same characteristics or components of the Sunday law crisis will be found in its twin, the marriage, okay? So we know very clearly from the Bible and spirit of prophecy that the Sunday law that fulfills Revelation 13, 11 and Daniel eleven forty one, 41 and Isaiah 8, 10, 1, that 
to get to the Sunday law that forces you to observe Sunday and persecute you for keeping Sabbath, that according to the spirit of prophecy in the great controversy, that the history of the first Sunday law is what illustrates this Sunday law. And then she tells us about how Constantine began the work to exalt Sunday, downplay Sabbath, and it was an erosion and then an attack upon the Sabbath over a period of time. Therefore, we know <coughs> excuse me, that there will be a series of Sunday laws in this history as the image of the beast is set up, but they don't fulfill Revelation 13, 11. They're just building the legal platform to put this one in place, and therefore we should expect, I would think, because this is the twin of this, that before we get to the midnight cry, we should expect to see in the government of the United States some kind of legal precedence being put in place to provide a legal platform to make some kind of law here, decree, about the marriage. So, uh, what I mean by that is maybe you would expect to see the Supreme Court make a ruling that gay marriage is okay in this history here. And it's setting up the logic for a decree that's going to come here. We have several witnesses that a decree takes place at the midnight cry. But this is the twin of this. <coughs> so these, these characteristics here will be it will be, it almost leads you to believe, sometimes you can understand, you can see that the midnight cry might also include some kind of Sunday law with it about marriage, about the family. And you hear the Pope uh, and his advocates always talking about a Sunday law that is, that is a Sunday law to, you know, uphold the family uh, situation, family values, there you go. Um, so the reason I say that is because in this history here, we have Haman's gallows being set up, okay? Uh, Haman's wife, the wife in control of the husband, is the one that suggests the gallows. They build the gallows right here. The image of the beast test starts. And when you get to the Sunday law, Haman's hung on those gallows, okay? Because Haman represents the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy, the United States, the kingdom that allows their wife to set up an image of the beast and ultimately pass a Sunday law. So in this history, you have the image of the beast in the United States. This is what Brother Mark was speaking about. It's the image of the beast, because if you're going to understand what the image of the beast was, then you but have to understand the beast, the papacy. And the papacy is a system that is based upon a church ruling over the political structure. So the United States, which the Constitution denied that very thing, okay? The Const that's what it was built for, was to deny that very thing. There's two things the Constitution was trying to prevent. A, a church controlling things and a king controlling things. They were rebelling not only against, not rebelling, but they were dealing with the effects of the papal powers influence on the earth for a couple thousand or for a thousand years. They were also dealing with the effects of royalty, the kings. So all that's built into there. But now the United States is reverting back to this system of the papacy. This is an image. It's a reflection of the papacy. Okay, but there's another line of prophecy, brothers and sisters. If you can follow this one, it'll help you make the distinction that Mark was making this morning about the image of the beast and the image to the beast. And he taught you very correctly that in this history of Haman's gallows, the image of the beast, the structure of the United States is being restructured to be the same structure as the papacy. The, the, the evidence that it has finally built that image is the Sunday law, because at the Sunday law, it proves that the church has the, the authority to control the government. The proof of that is when the church says, okay, enforce this Sunday law. And at the Sunday law, there is a true and a counterfeit many things. There's many true and counterfeit things that go on here. There is a holy birth here. Is not John the Baptist born here? 
Okay, there's a holy birth here, but there's a counterfeit, counterfeit birth here as well. You know, the, the, the Sunday law is the child of the papacy. Amen. Okay, so you have another line of illustration here. And right here, you all know that this crown here, it represents the, the development of the priest and the Levites to be lifted up as the first fruit offering, yes? At the Sunday law, as an ensign, they're lifted up as the first fruit offering, reflecting Christ. And there's a counterfeit at that time period. And that counterfeit is the image to the beast. Okay, the United States is the offering that's going to be given, that's going to be slain as the offering. Right here, the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy is slain, and it's lifted up as an offering to the beast. This is the image to the beast, and it's reflecting, the United States at this point is reflecting its God, the papacy, just like the 144,000 are reflecting the character of their God. So you can see another line here is talking about this true and counterfeit offering that gets lifted up at this time. You have the image of the beast leads to the image to the beast that's lifted up, but at, then we see the image of the beast being lift, built here, doesn't have to be built here, it's already in place essentially, but this same gallows here, which is a symbol of the image of the beast, is where Haman's ten sons, the ten kings, are going to come to their end at the universal Sunday law uh, time period. And the seventh kingdom, eighth kingdom is in that history. But, um, so what I'm saying is the characteristics associated with the Sunday law on several levels possess the same characteristics here so we should expect to see if this has something to do with marriage, that there's going to be agitation about the unholy marriage that precedes the time period of the midnight cry. Okay, that's, that's the logic why we have been presenting the things that we've been presenting. And then you lay over the line of the role of Islam in this, and you see on many witnesses that Islam's going to strike there and there. So let's move on with that. Genesis, first mention of Mara. And like I said, it's, this, this get, it hits you harder if you know the story of the two sticks and Dan to Beersheba. Or Beersheba to Dan, sometimes in the scripture, is representing the history of the midnight cry to the Sunday law. But the reason I'm saying that before we go to Genesis 46 is because this is where we're going to find Jacob when he gets the first Mara vision. Genesis 46. Did someone already cover Mara and I don't know it? Did you go through all the references? No, I just did. Which couple did you do? No, no, which references to Mara in the scriptures did you do? Just Daniel. Oh, good. Genesis 46, first place that Mara, the Mara vision is referenced. And this is the first illustration that has been recognized of the two sticks joining together. Did anyone deal with the two sticks? Yeah, Brittany? Did. No. Brittany? Brittany did. Okay. So this is... Jacob coming down into Egypt to join Joseph, and this is the beginning of the story of the two sticks. But before he goes into Egypt, in verse 1 of Genesis 46, it says, And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto God, the God of his father. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said... Jacob, Jacob, and he said, here I am. This vision is Mara. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for there will I make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again, and Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. So the midnight cry to the Sunday law is 
the symbol of Dan to Beersheba. And sometimes in the scriptures, it's Beersheba to Dan. But in any case, every time that those two words are in association, you can see that it's illustrating the midnight cry to the Sunday law. This does not have Dan to Beersheba. But Dan means judgment, and Beer means well, and Sheba means seven, the well of the seven times. This is the, the, the well of the study of the 2520 and judgment. So when Israel goes down to join Joseph, I'm not going to go into the two sticks, notice how many people come with Joseph, come with Israel or Jacob into Egypt in verse 27. And the sons of Joseph which were born him in Egypt were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob which came into Egypt were 70. So right here in this history we got the 70 associated with the joining of the two sticks right where it's supposed to be in that history represented by 70. But you have Beersheba marked and Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning and this is the end of uh, the references to Jacob's covenant when he's being marked in a covenant uh, illustration. The first place he's marked in a covenant illustration is in Genesis 28. And I would argue that the beginning has to illustrate the end. And here, Jacob's going to have a dream, but it is not marked as the Mara vision, but nonetheless based upon Christ illustrating the end from the beginning um, and based upon the fact that this is also a covenant reference. If you notice in verse 10 of Genesis 28, you'll know this story. And it says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba, okay, and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place, and he tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham the father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou lightest, to thee will I give it and unto thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all these places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken, of, spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord God is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. Whatever's going on there, there's a fear. There is none other but the house. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning, and Jacob took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall, thou, shall the Lord be, with, be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. The gate of heaven is right here. Why is it right here? It's where he wakes. Why outs? They poured out the oil. They poured out the oil. Why outs? A lot of, lot of terminology. Pardon me? The almond. The almond. is the almond tree. Why outs? The ladder. The ladder. I bet there's... Ah, the church triumphant. This is the, the house of the Lord. Okay, the house of the Lord. The church triumphant has just been reestablished here. But what I want you to see is, is that Jacob, in the beginning of his covenant history and the end of his covenant history, it has to do with Beersheba, and it's marked in here. Okay, midnight cry. But back to the, the subject of the Mara. Go to Exodus 38, 8. Exodus 38, 8. And he made the labor of brass 
and the foot of it of brass, and of the looking glasses of the woman assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. When they came out of Egypt, they took the mirrors that the, the women had that were brass in order to make the laver. And the laver, of course, is uh, the law of God, the looking glass. But this word looking glass is Mara, okay, the feminine of Mare. So what is it that the looking glass represents? Go to, and I know we're going into Greek instead of the Hebrew, but all the prophets are telling the same story. Go to 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 13 to understand what the looking glass is because the Mara vision is the looking glass. 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 13. 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 13 says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a, a glass darkly. Here's your looking glass. Now here, before the Mara vision, we see in part, we're children. We see through, three through a glass darkly. But when we get to the Mara vision, we're going to, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even also as I am known. And the Mare vision is the appearance of Christ, and you look at him face to face, and it slays you because you recognize your, right, your wretchedness and your unworthiness, and you crumbled in the dust like all the prophets. But once this experience takes place of seeing him face to face, then what are you going to do? You're going to rise up and you're going to see perfectly. Because this is where the spirit of prophecy is restored. This is where the hand is removed from the disciples on the road to Emmaus. This is where the hand was removed from Sister White in the history of, Ellen, of 1846. Okay, so I'm not following you. 2 Corinthians 3.18, I'm getting a, a tip from the audience. I'm going to pass by that because without them telling me, I know I'm over time almost. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a looking glass, the glory of the Lord. The prophets behold the glory of the Lord in this experience, whether it's Isaiah, Ezekiel, or John, and they do it by looking into the looking glass, the Mara vision, and it produces this experience of death. And then there is a three-step process that prepares them to give a message, but they're illustrating you and me. So it says... As in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the what? The same image. From glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. This is what puts the finishing touches on changing you and I into the image of the Lord. This Mara experience. And it's the effect. The cause is the Mare. Okay? And over here, brothers and sisters, I would argue that this here is the Chow's own vision. Okay, this, this is the vision of prophetic history. Right here, this is a turning point. This is a turning point. This is a turning point. Ezekiel was seeing all these things on the reform lines, and he was seeing the connections, the wheels within the wheels. He was seeing the glory of the Lord as illustrated in the reform lines that are represented in the sanctuary and the work of Christ that is identifying the sequence of prophetic history that takes place up at, at the end of the world based upon all the other reform lines of sacred history. That, he, was, he was seeing all these complexities that at first look like confusion, but they get turned into perfection. The Chow's own vision, the vision of prophetic history. But 
when you're in there, there comes a point where you're also going to be confronted with the mare vision, the appearance of Christ. And when that happens, you either flee, as those that were with Daniel did, or you're slain. And when you're slain, then the Lord is going to bind off, seal your experience in order to empower you and prepare you to give a message. Go to James 1, 22 to 25. James 1, 22 to 25. <clears throat> Be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Verse 23 of James 1. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, he is like a man beholding his face in a looking glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, the, the law of liberty is the looking glass, the law of God. In the law of liberty, where am I? 25, okay, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So the definition of the looking glass in the New Testament is there, but let's go to Numbers 12, 6. This is going to be um, another argument on the restoration of the gift of the spirit of prophecy to the remnant church. It, it, every time I say this, even if it's in a series of meetings, it seems like I have to repeat this thought at every time I mention it. It says the Lord gives the gifts severally as he will. One, he's going to give teaching, one prophecy, so on and so forth. But along with that, we have evidence that the people that go through this history, even if they don't receive the gift of prophecy, the Lord removes their hand, his hand from their understanding where they have a, a clear grasp of God's word. But having a clear grasp of God's word is not the same as being inspired and directed as a prophet is directed. So um, don't read that into what we're about to read in verse 6 of Numbers 12. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a Mara vision and will speak unto him in a dream. Okay, so if it's a prophet, he's had the Mara vision. Okay, that's what it says. Doesn't mean he's called to be the prophet through the Mara vision. Uh, might mean that. Called to be a prophet through the Mara. I, I, don't, I don't know, maybe. Okay, let's go to first. If, it, if he's a prophet, he's had the Mara vision. That, that's the only point I'm willing to, to follow up on right now. Go to um, 1 Samuel 3.15. We've been spending some time here in 1 Samuel 3 in my presentations anyway. Verse 15 says, And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel feared to show the vision. This is the Mara vision. And when does Samuel have this vision? Well, verse 10, it's Samuel, Samuel. It's right here. This is where the priesthood is being restored because Samuel is a priest. There's the rod. He's a judge. There's the law of God. And he's given the Mara vision. He's a prophet. There's Moses' writing that, are, that is in the side of the ark. Okay? And he's placed at the midnight cry. And, and Samuel here... He, in the story of Esther, we back him up 30 days, back here to 18 days before the way mark of 9-11. Time is no longer. This is a symbol. And you get to the 18th day where a prophet comes to Eli before Samuel's part of the story and tells Eli the same story that Samuel's telling him. The Seventh day Adventist his church, Structure gets wiped out at the Sunday law. And Samuel is simply the second witness to this. But here you have a 30 days in the book of Esther that takes you back here before 
And the principle is that Jesus illustrates the end of a prophecy with the beginning. So here and here, Samuel's being raised up as a prophet. This is taking us back to the point before 9-11 where there is a prophet raised up. This is 18 days in the book of Esther before 9-11. And we know that in Deuteronomy 18-18, that we see typified the history of William Miller, who was raised up of a, as a prophet in 1818, as had been typified by Elijah and John the Baptist and the other reformers that formalized the message in the various histories that prefigure this history. So somewhere before 9-11, there is a messenger raised up that presents the message that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is on borrowed time and probation is about to close. But we know that the message before 9-11 is the last six verses of Daniel 11 and the essence of those verses and the way they were always taught is that the primary verse in the last six verses of Daniel 11 is verse 41, which is the Sunday law in the United States, and it's here where the probation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is forever ended. They heard this back here. They get to hear it one more time here with a double outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and it's going to cause a shaking in the land. And that's just dealing with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they're also somehow, some way, going to confront the government of the United States in this history. Islam's going to, too. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the messengers here, they have a message not only for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they have a message for the United States. Perhaps, perhaps it about, it's about that, no, this message and this movement is not what's causing the problem in the United States. It's what you have done to the Constitution of the United States over the past 50 years. And these judgments are because of you, not because of the prophetic word. Okay? It's, it's a message to the government of the United States. As I understand it. But anyway, anyway, got to move on because I got a high sign a long time ago. In the Millerite history, <clears throat> this is the midnight cry. Everyone understand this? Yes. August 15th, 1844. But 25 days before, we will deal with that in the next presentation. Takes you to July 21st, 1844, the first time that Samuel Snow presented the midnight cry message. He presented it here again. In this binding off period of 25 days, you have several witnesses that this way mark and this way mark are the same thing. This is one of them. Midnight cry message, midnight cry message. Okay, But this date here is also midway from 419-1844, which is the point when they first thought the Lord was going to return. And October 22nd, 1844, if you count the days from here to here, the very middle of this history is July 21st, 1844. It's marking midnight. The pioneers identified this as midnight, and they made the distinction between midnight and the midnight cry. They knew it. They taught it. Okay, but I just want you to see Ezekiel 1.1. 1, 1. But before you go to Ezekiel 1.1, 1, 1, go to Ezekiel 8.3. I want to try to make an argument that I've only hinted at so far. And the argument I want to make is that when, when you have this experience, brothers and sisters, it's not simply the Mara vision. The Mara vision is the effect of the Mare vision. You're going to have the Mare vision. You're going to see Christ, and it's going to produce the Mara effect in you. 
But you're also going to see the child's own vision. you got to see all three of them. Because when the prophets are illustrated in here, they're illustrated as being slain. There's the Mari Mara cause and effect. But they're also seeing the glory of the Lord, which is these reform lines. It's this history. You, you, you see it all. Okay, I contend that for the first time in 6,000 years that the Lord today pulled these curtains back. And he didn't just do it today. He gave a brother a dream on Wednesday night here, I believe it was, that put the basic structure of this. Now we're seeing this. And for the first time in 6,000 years, these curtains have been drawn back. And we're seeing into the Holy of Holies like the prophets did. But that's not enough. You have to have all three to fulfill this experience. You still have to be confronted with the appearance of Christ and have it produce the effect of the Mara in you to be in this situation. That's my contention. And in Ezekiel 8, in Ezekiel 8, uh, verse 4, and Ezekiel 8 is, of course, where we see the four abominations. In verse 4 it says, And behold, the <clears throat> glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw on the plain. Now, this isn't the Mara vision, but he says, Ezekiel 8 is according to the vision I saw in the plain. So whatever the vision he saw in the plain is, Ezekiel is connecting it with the chow zone vision of Ezekiel 8. You follow me? So we got to see what the vision of the plain is. So go back to chapter 3, verses 22 and 3 of Ezekiel. Chapter 3, verses... 22 and 23 says, And the hand of the Lord <clears throat> was there upon me, and he said unto me, Arise and go forth into the plain, and I will there talk with thee. Then I arose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood before me there as the glory which I saw by the river Chibar, and I fell on my face. You see that he's going through this whole process? So he has a vision in chapter 8 that's according to the vision of the plane. And when he tells us about the vision of the plane, he says it's like the vision of the Chibar River. And the vision of the Chibar River is found in verse 1 of Ezekiel 1. It says this. Now it came to pass in the 13th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, I was among the captives by the river Chibar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw the Mara visions of God. So Ezekiel's letting us know that the Mara vision includes all of these visions. Okay, And he sees the Mara vision, and when does he see the Mara vision? He sees it on the, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, and brothers and sisters, the fourth month, the fifth day of the month, is July 21st, 1844, in the Millerite history, marking the midnight as the arrival of the Mara vision in our history. You follow me? Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we are desirous to see your glory. The prophets are examples for us, and Moses plainly asked to see your glory. We want to see your glory, Lord, but we know it's not simply the, the prophetic history represented by the child's own vision. It's also your face. And we want to have a heart and a mind that's willing to allow, allow that vision of you, your appearance, to slay us in a way that you can raise us up as your messenger <clears throat> and not to run and flee from you. We need faith. We need to be transformed in, in advance of this. Lord, we ask that this time that we've spent here this week studying your word will not only strengthen our faith that we can continue on in our study as students of prophecy, but that it can be part of the work that you've accomplished in us to prepare us for the binding off for midnight in advance of the midnight cry. The events of the world are demonstrating that this is about to take place. The, the circumstances of your church at large are demonstrating this is about to take place. The circumstances in th those that proclaim that they are following this particular prophetic message but aren't show us that this time is about in place. 
but our own hearts tell us that we aren't ready. We ask that you would finish that work of preparation for this coming midnight time, that we might be those that are represented by the prophets Daniel, Ezekiel, and John, and be raised up as your messengers during the time period of the midnight cry in the image of the beast. And we thank you for giving us this possibility. In Jesus' name, amen. You're the light, you're the light.